Hi everyone, my name is Joshua and welcome to Northern Solar. So we're continuing to answer the question, are solar panels worth it? And we're looking back at our production and consumption figures for December 2022 here in our house in Cheshire with an 8 kilowatt solar edge array and 13 kilowatt hour battery storage. So without further ado, we'll jump straight into the presentation. As you can see, the questions we've got this month are, do solar panels work in the snow? We had some snowy conditions here in December, which covered our panels on the front and the back of the house in snow. So we'll have to look and see how they got on at that point. And as you can see, when the snow starts to melt, it's still quite cold and icy. Quite a lot of the panels got blocked in um, by the falling snow. So we had some panels clear, some panels blocked. So we're gonna see how well the optimizers um, coped with that situation. And also we've got a new EV here. If anyone can guess what EV we've got by the end of the video, you get some bonus points. I'll reveal that later, so stay tuned for that one. So, on to the figures. December 2022, um, quite varied, as you can see. Lots of high days, lots of low days, um, sunny and cloudy. But you can see the big difference this month is the high is only getting to 6 kilowatt hours. So, the best we got all month was 6.09 kilowatt hours in one day, which is pretty low and then the lowest of 0.13 kilowatt hours. So that was the day when the panels were completely covered in snow. So answering that question, do solar panels work in snow? No. If they're covered in snow, they don't work. If you can brush the snow off, fantastic. We don't have any uh, way of getting up onto our roof without ladders and all that, so we weren't gonna bother doing that. And as you can see, by the next day, they'd pretty much cleared off, so it wasn't too bad. So total, present, uh, total production in December of just 87 kilowatt hours with an average daily production of 2.8. So yeah, not great. Putting that into context for 2022, since we had the panels installed in April, you can see as expected, it's following that curve downwards into the winter and it's really low. And we're not expecting much more for January 2022. So yeah, not great really overall. I uh, picked a random day for the um, uh, month of December, 9th of December. As you can see, starting the day, 8 a.m., solar panels just start to uh, start generating, up to a peak at midday when we had just one kilowatt coming from the panels at midday, and also only very briefly. As it, the day is very short, it came straight back down, a few cloudy spells, and by four o'clock, we're back to zero again. So a really short solar day, and when it's not so cloudy, you're not gonna get an awful lot of generation. Um, so this is a graph I started doing last month. Uh, hopefully this one's proving useful to people. This is showing our um, consumption and uh, generation and battery usage and everything in the house throughout a day. So the same day, 9th of April, uh, 9th, of April 9th of December, we've got the overnight usage here. So this is the um, small amount of draw from the batteries as we've um, had the electric underfloor heating system running. So you can see every now and again, it ticks on to draw some power from the batteries to heat the um, floor in the kitchen. Then as our off peak window opens, the house battery, so the grow watt 13 kilowatt hour battery starts charging here. As well as that, we're also charging um, the EV at the same time. So we've got a lot of usage in this off peak window. So up to nearly 10 kilowatts during that time. And then the batteries are fully charging, so it slows down. Got, I think this might be a uh, washing machine. No, not really sure what's peaking here. May have been um, preheating the car ready for an early start. Um, and then again, as soon as the off peak window closes, back to using the battery, which is these blue peaks again for the underfloor heating. Solar kicks in in the morning, this green band here. Not a lot of solar, but occasionally it's covering, including the, uh, the usage for the underfloor heating. Um, a little bit even in the day, in the midday there, I think we were maybe exporting a tiny bit because the battery had got to be 100% again. So weirdly, we probably shouldn't have charged the battery on to full overnight at that point. But then again, yeah, in the afternoon, sun goes down, battery usage um, as normal. And then in the evening, battery usage increases as we're cooking dinner and have the heater on in the lounge to uh, warm up the lounge a little bit with the battery power. And then again, back down to sort of just uh, minimal battery usage in the night time again. This graph showing the state of charge um, overnight. So the battery was slowly draining up until the off peak window when it opens up here. Battery charges from the off peak, gradually discharging during the day. 
but when the sun came up it actually did charge to full again. I think that little spell here is 100% and then again slowly discharging throughout the afternoon and then quickly discharging again in the evening. So hopefully that gives you an idea of what a typical day looks like in terms of generation usage in December. Okay, moving on. The uh, figures overall, everyone's interested in generation, uh, consumption, and obviously the money. So yeah, solar generation, like I said, 87 kilowatt hours. And we did actually end up exporting 27 to the grid. So perhaps we could have maybe predicted the weather a bit better and not fully charged the battery the day before it was going to be sunny. Uh, something to consider maybe in the... Uh, in January maybe we can set the battery to just charge to 90% instead and then let the sun do the rest if there's any chance of that. Um, so we've only consumed 60 kilowatt hours of our solar generation. Our grid consumption was up to 581 kilowatt hours this, this month which seems like an awful lot considering we have solar panels but as you can see almost all of that um, consumption from the grid is during the off-peak window. So that's charging the car and charging the home battery. Our peak time grid consumption is very low, so only 11 kilowatt hours in the whole month. Um, so yeah, total consumption in the property of 640.7 kilowatt hours. Breaking that down means we have a solar usage of 68.97% and we exported 31%. Ideally that would have been higher, but like I say, we, uh, we look like we were exported a little bit during the day when our battery's still full and there is those sunny spells and we're not using very much in the house. So something to work on maybe in the winter months that we use a little bit more of what we're producing. Uh, total usage breakdown, only 1.69% from peak time grid, 88%, 88.95% from off-peak grid and 9.36% from solar. Obviously it's very different in the winter compared to the summer. Those of you that saw my earlier videos in the summer will see these numbers pretty much um, inverted that the solar is using most of it. Uh, right, so yeah, financials. Um, anyone who was early on this may have realised that I've actually updated this video because this um, original version of this video had errors in this section which was showing the wrong numbers, so I've redone it anyway. So yeah, um, standing charge the same either way with or without solar, £14.69. Our cost for the grid usage was £47.32. pence giving us a total electricity cost of £61.99 for the month of December. We actually earned £1.11 from those uh, 27 kilowatt hours of export, so our net electricity cost is £60.88. That compared to an, a non-solar use uh, electricity cost, if we didn't have solar panels, the same amount of electricity would have cost us £196.47. So our monthly savings are £135.59. So even in the month of December, having the solar system, in this case, a lot of that is down to the battery, but having these installed has saved us £135.59. So yeah, pretty happy with that. Uh, so putting that into context for the rest of the year, from April where we started with these solar panels at the house, um, all the way through to December, you can see the same numbers here. I've got a little section in this graph which shows uh, how much we put into the car. So of the 570 roughly um, off-peak units of electricity consumed, 297 roughly were put into the car and 273 were put into the battery or used during the off-peak period for things like dishwasher and washing machine that we do overnight. Um, so yeah, total savings for the entire year so far from April to December, £1,133.36. Um, so yeah, not too shabby, pretty happy with those, those figures. Um, total generation so far, since we've had the system installed, 5,833, which is already above what the 12 month estimate was from our installer. So really happy with what we're producing so far. We have exported 3,240 out to the grid. And we are hoping to reduce that now. Um, we'll have a immersion heater um, tank installed in the, in the house in the next few months. So when it comes around to higher production months again, we'll be able to export less and use more of that to heat the hot water and save money on our gas bill. So really looking forward to that. Uh, yeah, so that's pretty much it for the financial figures on there. If we go back to this slide, um, I was asked in the previous videos if I could go back and show our payback calculator. Um, this one, it's interesting, like it's based on a lot of assumptions. 
that are hard to be very accurate with. Like we know roughly what we think we're going to consume in a year, which we've put at 6,500. And we know an average flat rate import rate would be 36 pence at the moment. It's looking like that's going to go up in April, but we'll see how we go. The standing charge doesn't really, really matter um, for with or without solar. Our export rate is currently four pence, We're hoping that might go up. We do know what the system costs. That's the total cost of our system to get install installed, which is £15,215.50. pence. Um, we don't know exactly what the system is going to produce in its first 12 months, but I'm hoping it's going to be over 6,000 now because we're already at 5,800 and we've got three more months to go before we get the first 12 months of data. These are the big ones, cell consumption percentages. Again, after 12 months, I'll be able to give an accurate reading of these because these change differently in the winter and the summer. So I guessed at 75.25, and that will affect how much uh, savings we're making if we're consuming or exporting. So yeah, at the moment there is an assumption of 75.25, but after the full 12 months, we'll be able to get a much more accurate idea of what we're doing there. And system degradation, half a percent, who knows, it's, it's usually around about that, but that's just an average of what people are using in the industry. And then annual inflation, I mean, who knows what's going to happen to electricity prices, and 7% is a normal average that um, the industry uses, so we'll just take that. Um, but yeah, basically bring those calculations through. Um, our system is predicted to pay for itself between the sixth and seventh year. Um, so yeah, so far so good. Not too happy, not too um, shabby for a payback period for a system with solar edge optimizers that don't necessarily need them. Um, so yeah, moving on, answering these questions that we talked about. We already mentioned solar panels don't really work when they're covered in snow, but how do the optimizers cope when we have panels that are covered in ice or partially covered in ice? So this is our, the pictures of the front of the house and the back of the house. This is the front array, so these three panels here that are darker, obviously they produced about half of what the uncovered panels did. So you can see here, these three panels up here are the ones that are darker, this sort of inverted on this uh, layout. So you can see these ones were really heavily affected by the snow and ice that's on them, but it didn't affect the ones around them. The ones that were uncovered still managed to generate 250 watt hours in a day um, compared to 126 to the one next to it that was covered in ice. And then even more uh, sort of uh, uh, on top of that in uh, on the back of the house, we've got this panel here that only generated 61 watt hours. That so must be quite heavily covered in icing. There's this one here. And compared to the ones in, up on the top row, which had no ice on them, 231. So yeah, in this situation, optimizers are clearly doing a good job. Um, are they necessary? Not really for, my, for me, because even though you can see we've got trees behind the house and trees in front of the house, they're actually on the north side of the house. So they don't really give us any shade. We have very, very little shade on our property. So this is the first day where I've really had this sort of discrepancies between panels. Generally, they're within one or two watt hours of each other throughout a normal day. Um, so yeah, they do work. They're fantastic when you need them. If you don't have many shading issues, doesn't really seem to make much difference from what I can see. But in no overall, if you have shading issues or these sort of things that are occurring more often where you've got panels that are blocked, then you can see quite clearly that a blocked panel doesn't affect the ones around it to the same extent. So that's really interesting. If you're interested in optimizers, feel free to drop me some questions. I'll happily do what I can to answer them. So yeah, moving on. Another big question, the new EV. Um, we've been um, getting by with just one car. We have a plug-in hybrid. So um, that's been for the last 12 months, but we've decided that we need an, an extra car in the household now. So we've gone out and bought a Renault Zoe. Uh, so that's a 2020 second hand, it's about two years old, um, Renault Zoe. So we went down to Kent on New Year's Eve to pick it up and it was a long drive back, but with a, just a 45 minute uh, rapid charge in rugby, we managed to get all the way home on in those two legs of the journey. Really happy, really comfortable car, absolutely love it. Uh, we got it from a place called Big Motoring World in Kent. So I'll put a link in the description. Uh, lovely people there, really had a great service with them, so would definitely recommend if you're in that part of the world, uh, go and check out their, those guys, really happy with their service. No, not a paid sponsorship or anything, just would like to shout them out because they were actually really good. Um, and I managed to get home by about 7pm on New Year's Eve, so not too bad. 
Uh, yeah, so I drove all the way home from Kent uh, on the motorway most of the way and then a little bit off the motorway when I was at home, getting closer to home. But I averaged four miles per kilowatt hour on the entire journey home. Uh, wasn't driving particularly fast, the weather wasn't great, but it was dark, cold, wet, raining, probably averaging around 60 miles an hour on the motorway, maybe 65. But yeah, in general, uh, really happy with the car so far. I'll probably go into more of that in another video, but yeah, absolutely loving the new little Zoe. Um, one last thing, little plug for me, if anyone's interested in switching over to Octopus, please feel free to use my referral link. I'll put a link in the description as well. Gets you £50 credit on your bill and £50 credit on my bill for me. Uh, so that's pretty much it. I'll put the camera back on and say, there we are. Nope. Where are we? Yeah, we are. <laughs> uh, it's getting late. It's Friday. It's time for a beer. Um, yeah, thank you very much for watching. If you've got any questions, please drop them in the comment box below. I do like answering them. And if, any, if nothing else, I'll see you next time. Thanks very much.